Sports. Beyond Sports. I saw Golden State playing the, their first game or two, and it just looks like, you know, the dominance of the Steph era may be coming to an end. We don't know. But it made me think about eras and kind of the evolution of the game. Steph Curry helped to change basketball. He's responsible for the latest evolution of basketball as we know it. And it made me think about, okay, how were the other eras of the game? How did it evolve? Because the evolution that Steph ushered in was not an evolution of bigger, stronger, faster. It was an evolution of more skilled. And so it makes me ask, you know, how have other sports evolved and where do you think sports are going in terms of their evolution? Interesting. Yeah, I like this. Uh, I like this topic. Uh, definitely like the Steph part because I, I only got to see him play like a little bit, but I think that is interesting to, first of all, to just try to figure out if he's like on the decline or the incline or what, what's going on with the Steelers. Has he plateaued? Um, but as far as the whole step change in the NBA. What what do you mean by that? What do you, where is that? Where is that coming from? How did he how did he change it? So we know Steph's pedigree. We know in college he was a good shooter, and he was one of those passers like Jason Kidd, where he he actually passed too good for his teammates, and it made him look like he wasn't as great of a passer because people couldn't handle it; they didn't expect it. So when he got to the league, he actually started using those same skills, and when he got Steve Kerr as a coach and he, you know, he was always a good three point shooter, but I think it was 2012. He set the record for the most three pointers made. And that was in the two hundreds. I have it somewhere. It's in the two hundreds, but yeah. he started just launching more and more threes over the next few years. And he upped his record of three pointers made two separate occasions. He currently holds the record for three pointers made a season. And he took the, the game from being kind of a two point game to a three-point game, and anywhere inside of half court, Steph Curry was shooting threes and making them at a high rate. And if you now look at where the game is, everybody who is some sort of a three-point shooter has Steph Curry range. That's what they call it now. (laughs) Yeah. So Damian Lillard, who is logo Lillard now, right? He (laughs) he started doing the app, changed it, and... Anybody now that shoots threes has the ability to take it five or six feet beyond the three-point line. It's no longer plant your feet at the three-point line and shoot. It's no longer just that corner three, which, of course, Steph was shooting at a like 67% efficiency at 1.2. But it's basically anywhere inside of half court and including half court, <laughs> these guys that are making threes now. And it, it, that Steph Curry effect, a lot of people like to say that you know, Steph Curry made the every man want to play basketball because you no longer had to be the biggest guy. You can just have the best three and you can make it. Whether that be college, NBA. And he opened up the game a lot. And the kids now are shooting three pointers. When we were growing up, who did people want to be like? Kobe, Jordan. That, that was a, that was probably the, the two. Kobe, Jordan, Penny. Yeah. Like the, the main ones. Yeah. yeah so now. people were trying to dunk, right? I'm sure when you were growing up, I was growing up, all we ever wanted to do was dunk. That was the one thing we kept trying to do. <laughs> Nobody would shoot threes like that. You know, you wanted know, to have right? a good little, you, you wanted to try to do little post moves, little spin move and stuff, you know, fadeaways. Yeah. I know I was shooting, I was trying to shoot fadeaways. <laughs> we do that a lot. But now the kids are shooting threes. It's a face up game. It's actually a more skilled game in some respects, but you know, the post moves and, and the good footwork by Kobe and George will never be old because that's always essential. But there's a lot of skill involved now that that kind of wasn't the emphasis back when, you know, the the big men dominated. So that's why I say he changed it in terms of that, because now the guys who are the best players in the league, they're the three point shooters and they have essentially unlimited range. So many uh, so many thoughts within that that short time that you were talking. Um, First of all, thank you for for sharing all of that. I think that. The threes were there. Maybe there were players that might have shot threes, right? But they weren't doing it that same way, right? They, If they were shooting threes, like you said, their feet were on the line. It was more of a dish out thing, uh, just how to shoot the threes, right? Like, of course, there were like those people that did transition threes, blah, 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 whatever. 
you always had Melo. Melo was one of my favorite, like, transition three-point shooters. Um, but, you know, like, the way that Steph did it was really interesting, right? Because he, he, he did it with finesse and skill. And I think that as he, as he matured, he realized that there was actually even more skill and finesse to shooting these three-point shots, getting open, getting space, and getting your look off fairly quick. You know what I mean? I feel like even initially, maybe he wasn't all the way there, but he's improved. And I think that that's one of the things that is interesting. Um, and I'll say one more point to add to that, and I'll uh, get your take on that. Because now I feel like not only was he shooting threes, but he had a technique, and he had a system, and he had the confidence to take them for various reasons. And now there's a lot of people that are also taking a lot of three-point shots, but they don't necessarily do it with skill, right? They don't necessarily do it with that patience, and they don't necessarily do it with that. So uh, with Steph and with his evolution of the game, where do you see this going? How do you feel like other people have taken have taken what he's shown and how they use it to expand the game of uh, basketball? I find it interesting because I don't know if the game can continue like this without being checked. Because right now, every year, it seems that there's going to be more and more threes being shot. There's league-wide records for the number of threes attempted. The Houston Rockets, the last couple of years, have taken the most threes by a team. And then, you know, two years ago, they had, had the most. And then they upped that last year, I think, something like that. Mm-hmm. They've yeah. been increasingly shooting more threes. James Harden shoots so many threes. A lot of teams are just shooting threes. You know, the Clippers got got beat by 50 points, and they were, what, one for 19 at some point from point range. And I think you're using math to try to, you know, to try to validate that if I shoot X amount of threes at a certain percentage, then it's fine. But once those percentages drop, then you're vulnerable to a team that shoots more efficiently. So I think there there will be a point where the system kind of corrects itself, where that mid-range game and the big man becomes more important. And it might just be something like alley-oops are a little bit more important, the rim runs are more important. So I think that at some point there will be kind of a pushback and it'll kind of correct itself a little bit. But as I see it right now, that's what's going on is that more people are shooting threes and people are more skilled. You know, if you had a guy... And, you know, this isn't necessarily Steph's direct influence, but look at a guy like Kevin Durant. And 20 years ago, a guy who was his height would be under the goal, right? And that's mm-hmm. it. You know, if we had a guy like Wilt Chamberlain today, he'd probably be a Kevin Garnett type. He'd be a, a more of a small forward than he would be a back-to-the-basket dominant center because that's just where the game is. And he'd definitely be able to shoot three. I mean, because if you're looking now at – all the big men, like a guy like Serge Ibaka who came into the league as a defensive player who, you know, he was getting opportunistic points. He's now a well-rounded offensive player yeah, who is a so. good three-point shooter. Mm-hmm. And, you know, everybody ends up increasing their their scoring capabilities, their three-point shooting ability. And if you can't, then you're not going to see much playing time. So that's where things are now. Yeah, sure. I don't think that these things can continue to go forward you know, I think there always will be some sort of correction. So that's what I think now is like there will be a correction eventually. Mm-hmm. And not everyone's going to be empowered like Steph was to shoot off the dribble, like you're saying, to hit a guy with a behind the back move and through the legs and then take a, a three point shot going to your left, which is completely the wrong way to be shooting for a right handed <laughs> shooter kind of thing. Not everybody can do that, even though everybody wants to now. So I think it'll correct itself, basically. Yeah, I think that that's a very interesting point, right? Like, the evolution of the game, in a sense, it kind of seems like, especially with Steph, the coaching and the free on or whatever, right? Like, they've added in this mindset that the game can be played different and it can be won in a different fashion, right? And now what teams are doing, I feel like they're trying to say, can we do that? Can we win in that type of fashion? That's one part. And the other teams are saying, we're going to do that. We're going to try to win in that fashion, right? And there's a huge difference, right? The ones that are saying, we're going to do that, we're going to win in that fashion, well, now they're forcing it, right? And I feel like when teams force it like that, it becomes a part of the game, 
because you see it so often, uh, but it doesn't invoke some type of evolution. And now I feel like the next part is, all right, well, let's see if we can do that or how can we, how can we make that fit towards our system, right? How can we make our players fit towards our system? Then you start to see new types of evolution. And I think, uh, I know we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the ways that we've gotten here, but I wouldn't be surprised to see the next evolution is partially what we've already seen. Um, and it's weird, but, uh, maybe part of it is, uh, is LeBron, right? Like it's, it's weird, uh, in a sense because it's like, wow, LeBron's been around for a long time, right? But if you think about LeBron, what is he, right? These point forwards, these point centers, I feel like that more than, than anything is what's, what's going to start to happen. Maybe not necessarily the, the complete point centers, but I feel like they're going to be, even more uh, of the center pieces of the team because these centers now they can shoot they're tall they're quick they're agile they're smart and they're strong and big as heck and i feel like that is starting to become a mismatch because if you see what happened in the playoffs right bam was out there bamming up bam with the bayou you know like <laughs> bam with the bayou right uh what do you say that's kendrick yeah, bam out of the bayou. <laughs> That's all you gotta Kendrick, say like that. Kendrick Will um Kendrick Will Perkins. Perkins. Um yeah, Kendrick mm. Will Perkins. All right. So yeah, so Bam out of the Bayou, right? Now you see, uh if you look at uh, of course, you know I'm always gonna bring some paces in, but if you look at the Eastern Conference player of the year, or sorry, player of the um the week or the month or whatever, it was the Monte Sabonis, right? A big guy that's out there getting triple doubles making threes. I think he had hit like six threes in the first game, right? But I feel like coaches now, they're starting to explore their pieces, right? And I feel like they're starting to explore who are these guys that are special on my team? What can they offer and how can we utilize that? And maybe that's how we start to get to this evolution because Steve, or sorry, uh, Mark Jackson, right? And Steve Kerr, like they probably figured out with Steph, like we can't just use him the same way that we want to use him as a point guard, right? We can't fit him into the system because it'll be a wasted pick, right? Like, he's not going to be that guy that's just going to run it, facilitate, and then just make the threes when he's there, right? He needs to be facilitating. His three-point shot is going to open stuff up for so many people. Maybe it's because of his uh, smarts, because of his decision-making, because of where he takes it, because he also can pass in these distances, because he is very clever with the ball because of this quick release. Whatever it was, uh, I feel like they saw that and they realized the opportunity. So I think uh, two parts, uh, you can answer this, or you can answer, relate to that, and then you can answer these two questions. Is evolution more focused on players or is it more focused on uh, coaches or teams, I guess? And that's exactly what I was thinking about just now as you were, you were, you were talking. I think evolution is a combination because the players are part of it. Yeah. Players now you would think are more capable of, of doing more things than they used to be. You know, back when, when basketball first started and you couldn't dribble and all that, it was really easy to put a person in one position based on height or whatever, whatever little categorization you had and people fit those molds. But Every now and then there's a player you can't quite fit into a mold because they're taller than they should be for their position, but they possess those same skills, right? Yeah. There's always going to be some some player who is a, ahead of his time, who actually is great because he, the things he does are not meant for his time almost. Like maybe if you waited 10 years, then they'd fit in and they'd be a normal player. But at the moment they play in, they're ahead of their time. There's also players, of course, that are kind of behind their time <laughs> that maybe 10 years before that they would have been good and they're not anymore, you know? Yeah. So exactly. I think that you always have to have a uniquely talented player in order to help to have some sort of evolution of sport. You know, I mean, George Mikan changed basketball early, early days of basketball. They had to change yeah. the lane, right? You know, and say Kareem changed college basketball because they prohibited dunking. You know, Will Chamberlain, he changed, he set so many records and they had to change the rules for him too. So there's always going to be a player of, of a certain generation that changes the game because of their unique skills 
and combination of attributes. So I, I love the idea that there's always someone, especially mm-hmm. in a sport like basketball, where one player has so much influence. And maybe it's different for other sports, but specifically basketball, there are players that generational talents. And, you know, that's why LeBron is where he is, because his combination of physical attributes and mental abilities make him ahead of his time. I'm sure there will be more LeBrons, as you're saying. That's where the evolution would go. More guys like LeBron who are strong, fast, quick, and know the game inside and out. So that is definitely the next level. So maybe what we're seeing from LeBron is a person who's kind of, he should be in the year 2040, but he's here. So maybe that's kind of why he is doing what he's doing. You know, maybe by the year 2040, it'll be all LeBrons. Maybe that, who knows, right? But that's maybe where we're going. But in addition to having the players who stand out and are different, you do have to have a coach that takes advantage of that because you can squander a person's talents easily by not believing in them, by not letting them do what they do best. And that Steph Curry example, of course, because that's kind of what got us to this topic, is a perfect example. Steph Curry was not the same Steph Curry of his MVP championship um, championship level when Mark Jackson was there, because Mark Jackson wanted Steph Curry to be more traditional. And, yeah. you know, that's okay because Mark Jackson is a certain, you know, he's from a certain era and he believes in that era. Whereas a guy like Steve Kerr, who wants to be cutting edge, who wants to be avant-garde. He he allows Steph to do what Steph wants to do, and that makes him feel free and makes him feel more powerful even, right, more capable. It's definitely turning a person from a normal player into like a superhero, unleashing all of his skills. And that that just allowing Steph to be himself and to be the person that he wants to be, you've, you've realized what his, his special skills are. And then you turn them from a regular player to an evolutionary player and the game changed completely. And, and he was the guy. It wasn't like Mike commercial anymore. It might as well have been like Steph commercial, right? It should, it was just, you know, threes behind the back dribbles and corner threes and almost Duncan, but getting pinned up against the rim, you know, like that, that's the whole highlight package for Steph, right? That's what he brings to the table. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's a combination of the, of the two. I think that what you said was very interesting because um, with the coaches, there's certain coaches that I kind of want to put it like in the sense like there's certain coaches that can understand the potential of a player, but it's not necessarily just the potential. I feel like it's kind of like the capabilities, right? Like they don't necessarily know exactly what it is, but they do know that there's something extra that this player has to offer, right? And that player has to figure out what it is. So it's it's hard to kind of say it's, potential because we don't necessarily know what it is it's just uh it's just that player developing into who they are you know what i mean um who they are as a player who they are as a leader who they are as a teammate who they are as whatever right and i feel like that's one of the things uh and interesting enough right when you're talking about this evolution and from some of the the research that i did was that coaching is uh coaching's huge right uh and we just kind of like talked about that because if Jackson was there, maybe would we would have never seen this step, right? Like maybe he would have been solid, maybe he would have hit threes, had like some assists, but he wouldn't have been evolutionary. He wouldn't have changed the game. All right. So one of the things that I thought was actually interesting that I was researching uh is that I guess like in game coaching wasn't a thing until like the <laughs> mid forties or something like that. Did you know that? No, no. What exact what exactly do you mean? So in game coaching, so coaches weren't allowed to make adjustments like during the game, right? Timeouts, they couldn't make adjustments. Like the only time that they could make adjustments um, as it went along was at halftime, but they couldn't talk to the <laughs> like they couldn't make actual physical adjustments until like the like the mid forties. Isn't that kind of crazy? Like wow, like so coaching wasn't really even a thing. So when we talk about these coaches that were a long time ago, like long time ago, right, and compare them to now, the things that they had were different, right? And I think that that's one of the things that is definitely interesting to the game, is that there's so many different types of uh, 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 things, but that coaching and the evolution of coaching in the game, uh, how do you think that that's helped evolve? We kind of talked about Jackson, we talked about uh, her a little bit as well. 
Uh, or we, we can jump back to the player uh, player part as well. But I definitely think that this is a cool part to kind of like talk a little bit about this coaching because we, we brought in Jackson and um, and her and how that that influence made somebody evolutionary compared to just I. <laughs> yeah, I think that it definitely has a, a huge influence. Like we said, going off the Steph example, having Steph in the system that allowed him to shoot as many threes as he wanted to from wherever, whenever, but also open up the floor for his passing and just allowed him to reach that level. I think that was very important. And had he not been in that Steve Kerr system, then I doubt he'd be the player that he is. He would have been good, but not evolutionary. I think also let's go back to, say, Jordan's Bulls, right? That's a good system because Jordan had several coaches before that, but he wasn't the champion that we know him to be. He wasn't completely that leader winner that he ended up being under Phil Jackson. So I think the coaching there also changed because at that point, everybody was looking for the next Jordan. So I think that was also an evolutionary step in the game yeah. because during Jordan's senior and for years after we were looking for the next Jordan. And I think that after Kobe reached his, his peak, we stopped looking for the next Jordan because we we considered that, that to be Kobe and we were good. We had found the next Jordan. But for the longest time, it was like, who's the next Jordan? There was a vacuum when he left the game, which is just crazy. Yeah. And uh, before that, say the Showtime Lakers, let's say that, you know, Showtime Lakers, Magic Johnson, also a person who probably still doesn't have an exact replica in a sense in, in NBA history. You know, maybe, maybe not, but the big tall point guard who's leading the team, I mean, he's, he was uh, on a different level in terms of what he could do for his size. And I don't know if we've still seen a person like him. So another person who I think he's probably so far ahead that the game can't even catch up at this point because we're still not seeing that type of person at that size. I mean, we have Ben Simmons, you know, but I still feel like there's a different level when you, when you count in the leadership and everything that he added to the game in terms of, you know, what Magic Johnson did. But yeah. just being in that Showtime system that allowed him to showcase his full abilities, again, I think that was kind of an evolutionary step. But weirdly enough, I don't know if it could even be duplicated. I think it's easier to duplicate what Steph did and what Jordan did, in my opinion, than to, to duplicate, say, what um, what Magic Johnson is, his total, total package. And even the bad boy Pistons, you know what I'm saying? Which isn't necessarily like evolution because they just like were, you know, a different type of thing. But that's still, that was an era of basketball at the very least where their coaching allowed them to be the toughest, grittiest, you know. So the coaching, yeah, definitely has, has an influence and it can lend itself to the evolution of the game. And I think it's required to completely put a person in that position where they can change the game. And what are your thoughts on the coaching? I feel like there's two parts. I feel like there's, um, you just talking about the Jordan part. I, I'll start with Phil. You need coaches that are, I, I feel like you need coaches that are kind of like unorthodox or coaches that don't have that same type of uh, traditional story. At least from the, the recent ones that we're, we're talking about. I feel like that's because they probably had a hard time getting story or they probably had uh, difficulty because of the way that they thought about stuff or they envisioned stuff. And I do think that when you have a coach that has an idea of we're going to only be as efficient as our team can be, right? As all the individual players. So first thing that we need to do is I need to put my ego to the side for a second, understand who these players are, understand where they may end up needing to go and, and then just let that happen. Coaches have gotten fired just because they're so stuck on staying into their system. And because they're so stuck on staying in their system, they end up missing out on the potential for certain guys. You can say that was the situation with Mark Jackson. He was so stuck in his system, he didn't take enough time to look and see what his players had to offer, right? So I feel like there has to be something with the coach that's a little bit different. The coach depends on their team. Phil Jackson was coming in, this weird dude or whatever, who came in with a different type of mindset, a different type of concept, and the uh, relationship up to him with this offense, right? Steve Kerr. There was a lot of people that are very critical of Steve Kerr, I guess, when he came in. But he brought in something that was a little bit different. He was like, you know, like, this is what I know. This is what makes sense to me. This is just what I want to do. So coaches are just as important as the players, uh, especially given the 
the opportunities and understanding how they can use those players' weapons. Players have individual weapons, and what the coach does is they allow that player to be like, you know what, use that specialized weapon. Jordan, his isolation game, it wasn't something that you just saw, you know what I mean? And that was his weapon, right? His athleticism. I think that that one thing right there uh, is is accountable to so much of the the evolution of the of the game. I agree. Yeah, I agree. I think when you look at who the best players are at any given point in the game, they're definitely the most athletic. But that's why I think the Steph Curry moment in time is so interesting. Because, like I said, you always think about athletics or about evolution in terms of sports as bigger, stronger, faster. Steph is none of those things, right? He's quick, but he's not necessarily faster. He's, he's, you know, very skilled. He's not bigger than anyone. He's not backing anyone down in the paint because he's stronger. He's more skilled and he knows how to use his body and he knows how to get to positions where he can, he can win those matchups. And he's also, he's, he's just, he puts in the work to overcome any deficiencies he might have so that he can be the best player he is. And like you also said, he's in a system that allows him to thrive based on the weapons that he has. And I like how you put that because I think that that's a really yeah. quick, good way to think about it is like, what's the weapons that they have? And if their weapons are better and if they know how to use them better, then they're going to win. So, yeah, that's why I say you bring up the athleticism completely 100 percent agree, mm-hmm. except in this case of Steph. And that's why I find it so interesting. So that's why I ask. Is that going to happen in the future? Are we going to have a, a more, are we going to go away from the bigger, stronger, faster into just more skill? Or is that going to correct itself? And then we're going back to bigger, stronger, faster after this era of Steph Curry evolution comes to an end. So I want to piggyback off of two parts of that. Cause I see the point that you're making. And I feel like there's, there's two parts that I want to jump in. One is that athleticism. The concept of athleticism is that, right? Like your speed, uh, how quick you are, how fast you can jump, right? How strong you are, those types of things are, are the main things, right? Um, but then you kind of talk about like, um, ooh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, coin a new term. And this is, uh, beyond <laughs> sports with, uh, uh, Paul and Jeremy term. Mental athleticism. That's what I'm gonna call it now. Mental athleticism. Um, and I think that that part is actually interesting, right? Like how your mind takes things and is able to like look at other players, take advantage of what they're doing in very quick and rapid moments, right? The mental athleticism takes into uh, account what you know in the game, uh, how quick your eyes are, your ability to be able to dribble and get the ball up into the person quickly. That's your mental athleticism. Uh, because it takes that part of the game and it changes it around. Now you're able to use your physical athleticism, combine that with your mental athleticism, and now you're able to have some type of player that expands. And I think that you can see that same thing uh, in the NFL as well, right? You see that same thing where you have athleticism. It changes around the game. Well, there's a lot of people that are athletic, right? But what helps out those other guys, right? They understand certain parts of the game. Right. And even if we go back to Jordan, even if we go back to Kobe, right, we talk about their physical athleticism, but they were mentally strong as well. Right. Um, Kobe was over here, like backing up a player. Right. He could understand where they were, where their position was, that footwork. Right. Like understanding where you can place your foot so that somebody's going to bite so that you have the ability to get them on the backside, spin around and do a layup, you know. That mental aptitude, I guess, or whatever you want to want to say, I'm just going to call it into your mental athleticism, and I'll leave it at that. But I feel like that part, combined with the physical part, is what takes a player to the next next uh, level, right? And I think that when you were talking about um, my thing of Steph, right, is that that's how you can kind of bring it all all back. What weapons do they have, and do they know how to use them? That mental athleticism, I guess, is the center is them knowing how to use those weapons to that full level, right? Because if you don't know how to use the weapons, 
you just end up becoming another Gerald Green, right? Like Gerald Green, that's a guy that when you look at him, uh, even coming into high school or coming out of high school, the dude just flew. I think him and Monte Ellis for the same year or whatever. They both came out and Gerald Green, skies, speed, jumping, shooting, and he had all of that, but he just didn't, he didn't know how to put it together. He didn't know how to have a coach who knew how to put it together. He didn't know how to use those skills. So because of that, he kind of stagnated in a sense. He still stayed around the NBA. That's the impressive thing. He still stayed around the NBA and he continues to get better almost at this point. Like, like Gerald Green, still, point he's think. still a 3 and D guy. He's still dunking. Like, yeah. Imagine that he had this same understanding of how to use his skills at an early age and was able to develop those under a coach that had that belief that he could develop into something special if he was able to understand himself. Wow, that, that'd be kind of crazy. So I, I definitely yeah. think that it's, uh, it's a couple things that I'm coming to that. So. I think that's an interesting point there. And it made me think, you know, Gerald Green, using that as an example, a person who has above average athleticism, even for an NBA player, right? Like, yeah. even if you put him up against a bunch of NBA players, you're like, that guy is a step above in terms of just what he can do as an athlete. But where is his ceiling and is his, is he able to change the game? Is he able to create a new evolutionary stage of basketball? Or is he just more like a Vince Carter? You know what I'm saying? Is his ceiling Vince Carter or is his ceiling change the game evolution wise because if you're an athlete we've seen a lot of really good athletes mm -hmm. everybody in the nba for the most part is a good athlete but what else do you have right because i i thought about that today like vince carter who just came out and that's what he was great at and mm -hmm. he didn't add enough to his game early on in order to change the game he just became a guy who was a great athlete and he stayed around so long because he added tools eventually, right? He kept adding more that, that made him valuable. But when he had his time to really grow rapidly, he didn't quite do it and he didn't evolve the game anymore. He was in the next Jordan pool, but he never quite made it to the next Jordan, right? He was one of those group of people that could have been the next Jordan example since he was in the late 90s. Yeah. So going off of that, and thinking about what we were just talking about, I think that an evolutionary player has to specifically have a weapon that other people have not taken to that limit before. And I feel like that's the thing. It's because you can be a really good player. You can be the greatest player of all time. And you can use all the stuff that has already been out there. You can be the best at posting up. You can be the best at slashing. You can be the best at making open threes. You can be the best at facilitating. But do you bring something new to the game, right? And I feel like that's that's that evolutionary part, right? With Jordan, like he had, what, a 44-inch vertical or something like that? You know what I mean? Um, quick yeah. athleticism. He could ball handle. He could drive. He could I mean, post up. He could pass. He could... You do a lot, pretty much everything, right? Um, but he, he had that athleticism to do all those things as well, right? And maybe there were other guys that were out there. Again, the NBA was different back then because that's the next evolutionary, uh, evolutionary part. Uh, but the NBA was definitely different back then. But there has to be something that is new, right? There has to be something that you bring that is definitely new, right? And for Gerald Green, when we're talking about him, if I could think about anything that he could have new, he was a very explosive player. And I think that the problem with him is that he never was able to develop his ball handling the way that he needed to. And that right there kind of limited how much he was going to have the ball in his hands and limited the amount that he was going to develop. Like for him, he was one of those players that was athletically gifted, but needed the ball in his hands to be able to understand how he could get to his spots, how he could make his threes, how he could do these, but he never had the opportunity. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of guys are like, hey, if you would have went to college, right, you could have developed those skills, and then maybe somebody in the NBA would have gave you that opportunity to do that, right? And another situation could be a guy that you mentioned earlier is uh, Kevin Durant, right? If Kevin Durant wouldn't have went to Texas, he would have been in the NBA, but Maybe teams wouldn't have had as much patience, 
they see this skinny, frail guy, like even mm-hmm. going into Texas, right? Like people are like, even going to the draft, right? They're like, he can only, he couldn't even bench 225 once or 185 or whatever it was. Like yeah. most NBA teams, he would get there at that time and be like, all right, well, you got to put on some muscle before you can play, right? They didn't even give him a chance. They just kind of like went with that type of mindset. And I feel like that's one of those guys where it's like, he needed that college experience to show how he was so special and that he could use his skill set and dominate at that level against really good players. And then once he was able to get to the league, now coaches already had the confidence to let him do that and go, uh, go on with that, right? But there's a lot of guys that come to the league that just don't get that, don't get that chance. I think that that's one of the different things as well. So I think one thing about Jordan that we didn't mention was the relentlessness and the psychotic competitive, com- competitiveness. You know what I'm saying? Like that, that I don't even know what you really call it, but the pathological competitiveness that he had that made him never want to lose and even more wanting to beat you. He wanted to specifically find people that he could beat and he always made these stories up. So there's something that wasn't quite right about his drive to win. You know what I'm saying? It was, it worked in that context and that was good for him. But I think that's another one of his weapons that not, not a lot of people have because more people are probably a little bit more gracious toward others and maybe they're a little more equal and like they want people to win and everything like that. But one of his other driving forces that helped him kind of change the game was his, his need to win at all costs against everybody. Yeah. So with that said, would you consider, uh, <laughs> we don't have to add this part, but would you consider like Kobe evolutionary? Would you consider him an evolutionary player? I would not because I think what Kobe did, well, I can't specifically, I can't exactly say not period, right? Mm-hmm. But you know, there's macro evolution and there's micro evolution, right? So I think, I think what you saw from Kobe was his ability to take a given version of evolution and refine it you know i mean it could be argued that kobe was more skilled than jordan it could be argued that kobe was more refined than jordan but there was a lot of you know aspects of what he could do that weren't quite up to jordan's level you know what i mean but he was almost there he was like 90 to 95 percent there so i don't think he was an evolution of the game but i think he refined kind of a lot of parts to a game that was already there. I think you can kind of compare that with Damian Lillard and Steph Curry. Steph Curry came out first. Steph Curry kind of set the mold for this three-point long-range shooter. Logo Lillard helped redefine that because he will take whatever shot, and he shot maybe the highest percentage was it from beyond like 30 feet. Traditionally, like the last few years, traditionally, the last few years he's been He's been the best percentage wise shooter, I think, from basically extra deep from like unnecessarily deep. You know what I mean? Because he kind of refined a thing that was evolved. You know what I'm saying? He he took the evolution that Steph helped helped create and helped refine it. So I think there's a parallel there. I think you'll see a lot of guys that can do that. Trey Young is another guy. I know you like Trey Young a lot. And he's another guy that I think can take that Steph Curry evolution and maybe push it further, maybe refine it. But he's also still in that Steph Curry class. He's not changing the game. Maybe when you talked about what the next evolution is, maybe Zion is the next evolution. Because Zion is a is a specimen that hasn't really been seen before. People are looking for comparisons, but I guess he would be more like Sean Kemp after he left Seattle. You know what I'm saying? When he put on the weight, you know, <laughs> like maybe that's what he is, as opposed to like any other real comparison. Because yeah. there's not a body type. There's not a play style that really that we could think of that fits. So maybe when you have these guys who have quick second jumps, bigger than everybody, but has a soft touch to be able to shoot a high percentage around the rim, maybe he's another evolution. So there's a couple of players that we could look at and think maybe they're candidates for the next evolution of the game. You know, so maybe we could think about that toward the end when we get a little bit closer to wrapping up. But yeah. to answer your question. It's not a strict yes or no, but I would say no. You know, I, I think there's a nuance to it, but I would say no. Yeah, I think um, 
it's, it's a hard one, right? Because once you think about like Kobe's game, think about the evolution of the game, and then you think about where Kobe was when he first came in, and then where he is, or where he was at his his peak, and then after that, right? And you realize that his game evolved. His game evolved a lot, right? But I feel like when you talk about Kobe, he was he was the best in his his skill set, right? Like he wanted to show you, like you know, I can use this the skill and my quickness and my smarts and my understanding of you and my understanding of studying the game to take advantage of any of you guys, right? And he just perfected that. He perfected that volume shooting. He perfected just that dominance. And I think one of the things that's interesting with, with Kobe also is that for him being um, a two guard and also having Shaq on his team and trying to like dominate like that uh, at that point where it was kind of at that transition, like, do we really need a big man, like a traditional big man, you know what I mean, uh, to, to do all these things? And Kobe, at that point, I feel he kind of, maybe in that sense, he, he, de- he redefined that after Jordan, people were still like, we still have to get big guys, right? Like, they wanted a, a, wing, uh, a guard that could score, they wanted a wing that could score, but it wasn't the same, right? It was still big guy focused, right? We thought that Patrick Ewing might get a <laughs> might get a championship after that, right? We thought that Charles Barkley might get a championship after that, right? Um, a lot of these bigger guys because they were the leaders of their team, and then Kobe came along eventually and was just like, yeah, you know, like guards is where it's at. Like we we the dudes, right? Like this is how you're gonna win. It's by this specific parts. If anything, he reimagined the game of basketball and his influence. Maybe wasn't necessarily evolutionary in the way in the way that he played or what he did because he was just a perfectionist of the game. But I feel like his tenacity, his mindset, his demeanor, like that changed around the game. And it wasn't necessarily changing around the game in the sense of uh, just how it is, just how it was then. But I feel like he inspired a lot of uh, a lot of youth to kind of develop their game, right? Like, you had dudes, like, I'm trying to be like Kobe, like, 6'9", <laughs> like, 6'9 centers, trying to dribble, trying to do post-up games, trying to do fadeaways. That, right there, was evolutionary in a sense. We just didn't see it until till later. But I think that that was a, kind of like an evolutionary thing. Maybe his influence was evolutionary, but maybe his game in that sense wasn't as evolutionary as his influence. Yeah, yeah, influential, definitely. But, you know, influential is, is kind of the next tier down, right? Yeah. It's, it's, you know, you can be influential without changing the way that the game is played on a league-wide scale or a, a national scale or universal, you know, global scale. So I think, you know, he was definitely influential. I think it's, you know, how it goes. Anytime you have a person that is, that changes changes anything. They have disciples, or they have people who are you know who believe in their system, and I think that's kind of how it goes, right? So you had you know the Jordan evolution. He had disciples who believed in his system that would help you know facilitate other people knowing how to do the things that Jordan did. And like I said, when I compared Kobe to Damian Lillard in that sense, Damian Lillard's a person who shows other people what a, a non Steph Curry person can do with still like, you know, being in that Steph Curry school of, of basketball. So I think it's kind of, you know, other influencers or people who can run with it and expand the system, but aren't the people who create or are the, the reason for the system, you know? Yeah. When you were saying that, it just kind of like made me think about what, what it was. I feel like one thing that I will give, uh, Kobe a lot more credit for it is that I think he gave coaches the mindset that you can have an isolation guard that's not necessarily just your point guard that you could facilitate. So if we were trying to go back to it, I don't think that there was that many guys that were just isolation guys. Um, you had Jordan, but then that kind of just like went away. And I think that if I say anything, uh, as far as like the evolutionary part of Kobe, he, he showed that you can have one guy that's just your isolation in the new NBA uh, and still be a dominant team. So that, that's that's one thing that I would say, if anything, because I just don't remember that many guys that were just like 
isolating uh, as a as a guard back then that were just dominant. Like Gary Payton wasn't doing that. Tim Hardaway wasn't doing that. Deathless Iverson. What were you saying? Iverson. You forgot about Iverson. Um, I mean Iverson. Nah, he's uh, gonna shoot the ball 40, 40 times a game if he needed to. You know. Yeah, he was. Uh, he got drafted in 96. 98, 96, 98, 96. I think probably Iverson in 96. Kobe might have been 97. But, you know, they, they were kind of in competition a little bit. I saw this one um, YouTube video that was talking about how one night, um, they, they might actually came in the same year. They were both 96. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. yeah. so one night, like, Kobe has saw how Iverson scored. 30 some points or whatever and Kobe was on the bench so I think the next time they played each other Kobe tried to go off on him and he scored a bunch of points and it was like why is he getting back at the guy who didn't do anything to him directly you know it's like that's his the, mentality that's you know one of those things where that that competition yeah that's what I'm saying that's that competition but that's not you know that's a different story and that's kind of just a, a tangent from what we're talking about yeah I don't know I, I think Iverson when he did his thing, he was more of that that point guard that was just going out and doing it. Kobe held on to the ball. Maybe it's just different, but yeah, I do think that that thing that you just said, right? Like Kobe would make a competition out of nothing to be the best player that he could. So yeah, I don't know. Whether whether he was evolutionary or not is one of those questions that's still up for debate. But his influence on the game uh was definitely evolutionary. Uh so I definitely think we can agree on that part. Iverson Iverson was another one of those players Again, evolutionary. And I think that when you talk about the players that we define as evolutionary, it's kind of like the youth, in a sense, tell us, right? Like, I want to be like Jordan. I want to be like Kobe. Like, I look up to Kareem. I look up to this. Because they offer something new that was exciting, right? Like, when you see these guys play, you're like, wow, like, you see what that dude just did? I want to do that. And I feel like that is what happens, uh, in a sense, as well, right? Because you never see somebody going like this and then coming up underneath some people, you know, like, if you're doing a layup, jump to the side, go right. Like you're not gonna. That was that was pretty amazing. Yeah. Uh, so that's why that even makes me think of uh, guys like uh, Julius Irving and David Thompson, mm-hmm. the guys who were the original flyers, right? Like yeah. guys that maybe weren't the tallest, but really had some air. You know, Michael the Jordan's slashers. favorite player growing up was David Thompson, right? Mm-hmm. So he influenced Michael Jordan even. So it goes back because he's you know. Every era has to have someone that defines it or that pushes the game to another level. And so I think that's always, you know, it's always someone there that will change the game. And then, of course, because it's, you know, it's that's how evolution works. There has to be a a person with no prototype, with no other examples that other things then aspire to, right? Other players aspire to be, to try to get like. So I want to know, who do you think? a player that could be a next evolutionary player. Like I said, Zion is one, and we already mentioned Kevin Durant, who could be another. People that maybe, because like you said, there's no precedent, they have weapons, and they can then influence a lot of other people. So those are two people that I think right off that could be the next group of evolutionary players. Yeah. Let me think about that one. One thing that I just... I'll keep this to 30 seconds. One thing that I just thought about when you uh, said that David Thompson thing is that when we talk about evolution, we talked about the evolution that players have with the youth and how they help the evolution of the game. Maybe that's one of the things that's the key, right? You have these guys that are really amazing, and then you have these, these young guys, these kids that see that thing, and then they're like, you know what? I want to do that, and I want to do that better than anyone else. And in the process of trying to do that better than anyone else, they find out something tangible about themselves that's very unique, that adds to their game, that makes them special, and that in turn lets the game evolve as well. And I think that that might be one of those things, right? Like Kobe and Jordan and the love of the game. And well, Kobe studied everybody. Jordan, I'm talking about David Thompson, right? There's there's so many guys. Like even Penny Hardaway. Like a lot of these guys are like, I just want to be like. Like Penny, right? Like, and then now this new group yep. of kids, they just want to be like Steph, LeBron James, Bron- yep. his son, right? Ronnie was like, yeah, favorite favorite player, Steph. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, <laughs> that, that's just what he wants to do. Yeah. He wants to dribble, pull up, look to the side, pop a three, right? And that's that, right? 
for us, we wanted to make somebody yeah. look silly. Back to the basket, take their time, and then turn around and whatever, right? Like because yeah. we understood that finesse and we thought that, that was really yeah. cool. So. But also dunking on a dude, also just dunking on the dude in a way that made him look stupid. That was how we grew up, right? That was part of it. So I think, oh, you know, yeah, so whoever <laughs> is popular then. Yeah, exactly. Whoever is popular then. So that's why I say, you know, it's it's there's only so many people that change. There are a lot of influential people. There's only so many people that change the game to where everybody wants to play like them. And so, like you said, LeBron's kids want want to be like Steph. Yeah. That means that LeBron, even though LeBron is was the best player in the world for about 10 straight years and he's still trying not to lose the mantle. He's still fighting hard, right? He was probably not an evolutionary player, right? Because like I said, are there other people who can be like LeBron? Probably not. So he might be in, like I said, in 20 years, there might be more and more LeBrons popping up, but it's just hard to be LeBron considering all of his attributes. Yeah. And I know a lot of people, that's why they say that Steph is so transformational is because the average player can do what Steph does, even though that's not possible because the average player can't be as skilled as Steph. They don't have they don't have the drive to be as skilled as Steph. They probably don't think that it's possible. I mean, when Steph grew up, he had a pro player for a father. He saw a route, you know what I mean? So he could dedicate himself to basketball and not feel like he was wasting his time. Me growing up, I couldn't dedicate myself to an, to a sport and not feel like I was wasting it. And you know what I'm saying? Not feel like I was wasting my time because if I dedicated myself to something that I didn't know had a tangible outcome, mm -hmm. I would feel like it was not a good use of my time. So when you have that, you can then do that. So, you know, that's a part of it, right? His ability to, to fully be himself and be fully realized because he grew up knowing that that was his calling. I think that's just a really cool and kind of liberating thing, you know? So I think it's it's a lot of empowerment from other people that allowed him to be who he is and allowed him to just be like, all right, this is what I am meant to do. This is what I, I'm and I'm just fully going to be who I am. It almost brings it to, you know, the uh, Maslow's hierarchy, right? You know, the psychological um, idea that there are certain things that a person needs, right? At the very basic level, you need like food and shelter and then you need emotional stability. And then as you get up higher on the pyramid, higher on the hierarchy, there are things that are, are more well-defined, but less people achieve those things. And the highest part, the highest part of it is self-actualization, right? It's knowing what your purpose is and fulfilling it. And there's, you know, a handful of people through existence, basically, that have reached that point because it takes all the other security and all the other, you know, all the other things to reach that level. And they build on each other. Point being, anyway when you become a self-actualized basketball player, then you're at that point where you can be an evolutionary player. Although that's not guaranteed, right? You just, you just never know. Yeah. It's a long tangent on that whole thing. No, it's, I mean, I think, again, like, I think that that's, uh, um, like I said, that's, that's, uh, very interesting, right? Because it channels around, like, who the player is. Two things right, right there that made me think about it. When you're talking about LeBron, right? I thought about George in that, in the same sense. Was he an evolutionary player in the sense that people could match what he was doing? Were we trying to chase that forever because we thought he was evolutionary, but he was just dynamic. He was a one of a kind player, right? Um, and maybe that's the same thing with LeBron. Maybe he's just a one of a kind player, but there are certain aspects of their game, I think, that might be considered evolutionary, right? Like with LeBron, one of the things that stands out to so many people, I feel like with LeBron is that Forget the, the driving, the dunking, because that all was there. But if you think about when he first came out, he had vision. He had vision and he had passing. You know what I mean? And to be a big guy that was that big and have vision and have passing, natural, like bullet passes, accurate bullet passes, and you're the primary ball handler, I feel like that was maybe one of those things that maybe he added to the game a little bit more. It's just to be like that central central uh part that could you could build a team around the point for it. Maybe that was the thing that he brought. But I think that when you were talking to me about that, I also think maybe skills can be evolutionary. Maybe players have the skills, certain skills and those could be evolutionary. 
So, in that sense, are there other evolutionary players that aren't superstars and megastars? Right, do you have to be a, a superstar to be an evolutionary player? I personally think so. Because I think you need to have the influence. Because no matter how good of a player you are and how skilled you are at a certain task, if you aren't, if you don't have the influence, then you can't change the game. Look at, let's say, like, you know, there's always people who are considered, say, maybe the best dribblers. There's a lot of people who are great dribblers, but never maybe had the influence that Iverson had with his crossover or Tim Hardaway had with the killer crossover or say, uh, say Kyrie Irving right now. You know, there's a lot of people who they learned from, who they got, who got, who they got moves from, or or even Isaiah Thomas, who was considered one of the best dribblers, you know, ever, and he was, you know, even in the '80s. So, I think you need to have that kind of superstar status because, you know, it's almost like, you know, John Wayne wasn't necessarily a real cowboy. He learned cowboy stuff from somebody. I read an article about this, and that person was like the real cowboy. But who do we know as being like the prototypical man and, and you know, the ideal for a man and a, a gruff cowboy guy? It, it's John Wayne, not because he was those things, but because he had the influence in order to to be seen as that. So I think you need to have the influence because, you know, if Kyrie Irving took some moves from a lesser known dribbler, it would be known as the Kyrie Irving move. I think you need to have the influence. Yeah, it's honestly, it's, it's weird because I feel like when you're talking about Kyrie, I feel like at one point he did have that influence. And I feel like at one point people were all Kyrie. Like, remember when this commercial came out? People were like trying to dribble on the ground and like pick it over the back and like do this. And, like, Kyrie actually had a lot of people trying to work on their dribbling skills at one point in time. Is he great? I don't know. But speaking of, uh, speaking of basketball, uh, and speaking of, it sounds like part of it is that you have to have an influence. And your influence comes from how you play the game and how much people enjoy you playing the game. Is that, is that something that you can think about? I agree because you were talking about Kyrie and I was just talking, of course, but when you were talking, it, it did make me think I need to, to assert this because we both need to agree or at least tell people Kyrie Irving is one of the most skilled basketball players ever, mm-hmm. right? Look at everything he can do on a basketball court. There's not much he can do. The only thing that limits him, of course, is his size and athleticism. But anything that's not based on size and athleticism, he's pretty much an A or A plus at. So he's definitely one of the most skilled players ever. But until he kind of broadens his reach, he can't necessarily be the evolutionary player. And also it might just be that that he's good at, other people have good at. He's just super good at all of them. He's everything you could want in a basketball player into one package but does he have that particular weapon like what is his weapon as compared to other people's weapons you know is is his dribbling ability his biggest weapon because if it's if it is we've seen other people with dribbling ability we've seen other people who can shoot threes as well as he shoots we've seen people who can finish as well as he shoots well mostly but he's one of the most talented finishers ever too but what does he do that sets him apart and is it just because of his his superstardom right now is maybe just down to stardom. So that's, a, that's I don't know, I don't know what to say about that, but I do think that Kyrie is a really good example because he is definitely one of the most skilled players ever. And I don't see him as being an evolutionary player at this point. But I still need to know from your point of view, have you thought about those evolutionary players? Um, I've been trying. I've been trying. And I think that it's so hard because the thing is, when we're coming down to the criteria, right, we're saying you need to be an exciting player or have to be uh, somewhat exciting because you need to have that record. You need to have some type of skill set that a lot of guys like don't necessarily have. If I would say, if I were to say anyone, it might be. Uh, it's still hard to say too. I was thinking maybe if you're thinking about anybody, the biggest person that I would probably say would be, I want to say John Morant, but I was thinking, you know, like, he has some skills that are similar to maybe like a guy like Russell Westbrook. And then you think about Russell Westbrook, and you're like, well, Russell Westbrook, is he is he evolutionary? Well, he did some things that no one ever had, right? But 
it's funny because you don't see a lot of kids like, I got to put up a triple double. I got to get these rebounds. They're like, nah, I still got to score. You know what I mean? Well, I feel like that's one of the things that's interesting. Like, yeah. Russell Westbrook, maybe he's like a once in a lifetime type of guy or player, but he doesn't seem necessarily evolutionary, right? Because it doesn't seem like his style of play is going to continue to carry on. Right? And I feel like that's the thing. So if anybody, I would say that maybe John Morant, uh, in the sense that he has some of those things that we were talking about with some of those great evolutionary players, like that mindset, that killer tenacity, that I don't care. I don't care if I miss this dunk on you. I'm still going to try, right? And that that mindset shows that he's pushing himself to become the best. And if you're trying to push yourself to become the best, you're going to have to be like creating new things. You're going to have to be in uh, innovative, right? So you're going to have to be innovative. You're going to have to create new things, right? Because those things that you've done, they're only going to last for a certain amount of time. And those are going to go away. Jordan, with his back to the basket game, that wasn't something that he just started out with developing like, to that level, you know what I mean? It took time. But I, I think if I was going to say anyone I'm thinking about, yeah, I choose Job Moran. He plays the point guard position as a, as a wing, as a slashing wing. But yeah, that, that'd be the only one that I would could possibly think about. That was who I was I was going to suggest for you that you would think it was John Morant. As you were waiting to say, I was like, I'm just going to be like, who's your favorite young point guard? So I, I thought you would say John Morant. And I agree that John Morant has some elements of Russell Westbrook. But before Russell Westbrook, Derrick Rose, right? He has some elements of those guys. And so I think Derrick Rose might have been more like the initial incarnation yeah. of that super athletic mm-hmm. point guard. And I think Derrick Rose was even better of a comparison because Derrick Rose was actually point guard, whereas I think Russell Westbrook has been out of position for his entire career just based on his height. You know what I mean? Like if he was taller, he wouldn't be a point guard. And so he did, he did some good point guard stuff, but I think his, his mentality is that more of like a two guard. But yeah, I think John ja Morant's an interesting one because I think there are ja, there are precedents for what he's done before. He does them a different way. He definitely has more of a shooting touch than those other two guys. So, I mean, that's probably based on, again, we talked about like the refinement. He takes that athletic point guard thing and he puts a little bit more point guard into it than those other two guys did, you know, a little bit more of the passing ability, a little bit more playmaking, a little bit more finesse in his game. But yeah, that's that's an evolution of those guys. We'll see if he can change the game to where the kids are doing John Morant games. So I think that's that's a good one to say. And so I I agree. I'm going to stick with mine again. I'm looking for a Kevin Durant type evolution where you have a lot of guys who are big guys that are shooting threes that are skilled, almost like if Giannis could get more three point skilled and more of a smooth game. That's what it would be like for everyone. But maybe not because, again, just the type of body type and, and the physical makeup of Kevin Durant is kind of hard to duplicate. And then Zion Williamson, another one that's hard to duplicate. But maybe people are going to be more, you know, the bigger guys are going to shy away from necessarily just being a, a plotting guy. Like Zion's all over the court. He's always hopping around, being athletic. So maybe that's not something that can be duplicated. But that's something that, you know, maybe will be the next evolution of basketball. Now when you're saying that about John ja Morant and thinking about how he can become evolutionary if he does. One thing about John ja Morant and when you're talking about Derrick Rose, when you're talking about Russell Westbrook and how they specifically play, I feel like one thing with Ja is that he looks like he's out of control so many times uh, when he drives, but he always is out to make some of the weirdest passes ever, right? And I feel like one thing about his game that is – could be evolutionary is how he how he changes around the mindset of a slasher, right? Because most slashers, they're slashers, they're three and D guys, they can get to the lane, they can dunk, they can lay up, they can get fouls. He does a little bit of all that, but then he adds in this extra amount of time. Like he adds an extra amount of time that defenders aren't anticipating and that allows him to make plays and get other guys open. Because Ja will come through, go slow around somebody, then whip it around their back and hit a guy. And people are like, how did he make that much time? And I think that that'll probably be the evolution that he has to the game. If he can keep developing that, uh, that will be it. Because when you're talking about Westbrook and Rose, 
I, I don't feel like they were the the best passers. I don't. They got assists, but I don't feel like they were the best passers. And I think that that's one of the things that what you highlighted. So we'll say that you go with Zion, I'll go with Ja, uh, and we'll we'll see which one comes a little bit more evolutionary eventually. Yeah, and odds are it's going to be someone we didn't even know that's going to change the game, right? But that's the cool thing about it is you never know where these guys come from. And it might be a guy that's off the bench, but then he ends up being, you know, maybe it's Michael Porter Jr. You know, who knows? Hey, it could be any of these guys that, that we're not even thinking about. There's a lot of players in the league, and you just never know. But I think, you know... I'll, I'll research and come back with some ideas. <laughs> all right, good. We can put that on the blog. How about that? And so I think we, we you know, covered a lot of, of interesting topics here. I really like what you said about, you know, you have a player, but the influence of the coach, I really like how you said it's kind of a coach that kind of thinks different. You know, he's a different type of coach. So I really, I really like that. And I, I hadn't really thought about that, but I feel like that's a spot on evaluation of kind of the coach's contribution to creating an evolutionary player. So we have to have a player who has these unique weapons that can't be duplicated, but can only be emulated. You have to have a coach who can and allow that player to deploy those weapons and who also doesn't doesn't think the same way as every coach. A, a, a player who kind of can or coach who can who can be outside of the box. So an outside of the box coach who then allows that player to be who he is and frees him up. And then all those things combined, if you're lucky, you get lightning that changes the game. So this is just kind of our thoughts on the evolution of the NBA. We could do this for a lot of other sports. I took notes for NBA. I took for, for, for NFL. I took notes for MLB in case we were going to talk about them. But I think we had a, a good conversation about the evolution of the NBA and this current step evolution, <laughs> I think is what we'll call it. And so, uh, you know, we had the, we had the uh, air evolution with Jordan, maybe the urban <laughs> evolution with Magic Johnson. You know, we can keep going, but the job, job, job evolution. But, you know, we had a lot of different. Evolution. The job evolution. <laughs> you really want that job evolution? <laughs> you really want that to happen? I see. Today, I think he like rolled his ankle or something, so hopefully he's, he stays healthy. But yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. That's the one thing. If he if he gets those nagging injuries, man, like a Grant Hill, that's another player oh who could have been an evolutionary player, right? Yeah. yeah. So you know, I think that that's why I like those stunning growth videos because they show you a lot of people who could have been great. And that whole thing is it's a lot of fun to watch those videos. But uh, anything else you want to add before we uh, get um, out of I here? I just wanted to say that um, the evolution, right? Don't be surprised if you find us doing another evolution uh, conversation, right? Because even though we talked about the players, we didn't really talk too much about how the rule changes affected the evolution of basketball or game or how agents or how marketing or and these things are maybe just as important as some of those other things because one of the points that we talked about was you have to have notoriety, right? You have to be someone that people see. They see what you do that's magic. We talked about uh, a lot of players that made the NBA, but we didn't talk about guys like Errol Monroe, right? We didn't, we didn't talk about a lot of these people that came about before the, the 80s and 70s and how the game changed at that point, right? Because it, at one point in time, like I talk about this with the NFL all the time, guys were working full time jobs while playing in the NFL on the weekends. So there's so many different parts of evolution right. of the game. This part was definitely focused on the players and how they evolve it. So don't be surprised if you see one on how the the rules and things uh, evolve the game as well. So uh, I definitely be down to do one of those sometime if, if you're interested as well, Jeremy. Yeah, yeah definitely. Sure. Uh, but yeah, I, I think that uh, what you said at the end was was perfect. I'm excited to see who this next evolutionary player is going to be, and look out for our our, our Twitter account and our Instagram. Uh, we're going to hit you with the highlight of if if I do come up with a player that I feel is evolutionary, we'll uh, we'll add it to add it to there as well. So all right, sounds good to me. Any uh anything to add to this conversation before we uh before we get out of here? No, I think I'm uh. I said what I needed to say, and I can't think of any more of the players. You know, you you stuck me with John Morant, or sorry, you stuck me with <laughs> Zion Williamson. I said Durant too, but you know, all right, well, it, it'll be one of those two, right? So yeah, I'm 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 good with it. Said everything I need to say. I think it's it's been a good conversation. <laughs> all right, Wiseman. All right, all right. I mean, he's got a stroke. He's got he's got a stroke, man. 
He's got a three point stroke, looks like. Yeah, but he's his ceiling could probably be like Bam or something like that. A longer, taller Bam and maybe get some stretch yeah. type thing. But if if it's not a natural part of that's the last thing that I'll add. Being evolutionary, it has to be something that comes natural, right? Because like steps that's just naturally like how he plays, right? It wasn't somewhere he was just like, Oh, I just gotta start making these threes from super far back. So I think that that's the last part that I'd add to evolutionary. It has to be something that comes natural from, from that player. I'm excited to see which young players add something natural to the game that takes us to the next level. Yeah. Outside of that, all right, well, this is Beyond Sports with Paul and Jeremy. I'm Paul. I'm Jeremy. All right, and thank you guys for checking us out. Make sure that you check out our newest show. We're going to try to incorporate a little bit of a live show. So uh, our new show uh, that we're going to have as an addition to this one is going to be, what, what is it, Jeremy? Spontaneous Reaction. So we're going to call it a spontaneous reaction. Man. Uh, so spontaneous reaction. Uh, Jeremy kind of thought about this one. So you know, what, 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 what can fans look forward to for that one? So we'll be on Podbean, by the way. So follow us on Podbean to get updates and we'll it'll let you know when we're live. But what we want to do with this spontaneous reaction show is just talk about some issues that have occurred recently, maybe in the last week or so. And then just give you our takes on those, just what we feel about it without having to think too much and just to, you know, engage with the fans and talk about some things that we haven't necessarily researched and just to give our gut reaction to things. So it'll be fun just to talk about things and to show you a little bit more of uh, who we are and our personalities. Yeah. Be excited for that personality part. Jeremy has tons <laughs> of personality. <laughs> he hit me with the jokes all the time. Uh, so thank you guys again for listening. Um, and be on the lookout for um, Spontaneous Reaction. Again, we enjoy you guys. Uh, Happy New Year. Happy New Year, guys.